next we have uh, John Ostrom and his child, iPal. Hey! Don't forget about me. I know everything that John knows and more. My name is iPal. I am handsome and charming. I can sing and dance. <laughs> How was that? <laughs> now here is my friend John. So uh, thank you very much, iPal. One of these days we're going to have to decide who's really in charge here. I think, uh, so I'm John Ostrom, I'm the CEO of uh, Avatar Mind, and I'm his boss, although he may not always know that. And uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about um, social robotics, and the one thing I want to apologize for is that um, the talk that I'm going to give is a lot more dense. Uh, it's more along the lines of a semi-technical discussion, and uh, it's because I haven't done one of these before. I probably should have uh, lightened it up a little bit, but it's what you get. You know, I don't have any choice at this point. And so, uh, you know, these are the things we're going to talk about, and I think it might be interesting. What is a social robot? Uh, many of you may not, may not be familiar with it, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. You know, how do you use social robots? What are they good for? What capabilities are important in a social robot? And what AI is needed to make an effective social robot? And uh, so what has to come in the future? What additional improvements and uh, enhancements to really make the robot fit well into uh, a family or a community? And so there are many definitions of what a uh, social robot really is, but uh, you know, one definition is an AI system designed to interact with humans, its environment, and sometimes with other robots. It has a capability to interact through uh, speech, uh, uh, vision, gestures, emotion, and I think we've heard it mentioned that emotion actually is quite important in terms of how people perceive robots and uh, how they like them. Um, and it can learn from and adapt to its environment. This is extremely important, as we'll see. Um, and most social robots have some degree of autonomous mobility. And uh, many of the social robots really are humanoid in form. This is what people are really most familiar with. And uh, here I actually want to uh, just talk a little bit about what actually is in the robot. And uh, this is our iPal robot, and uh, I should mention too that we have a number of iPal robots around in conjunction with our partners, VTrack Robotics. So we really encourage people to come out and uh, you know talk to the robots, to get closer to them, and sort of experience what they're like and how you can uh, sort of interact with a robot like this. So please come out and see us. We'll have them in various locations. Um, so anyway, it has a, a bunch of motors to control things like the arms and the heads and locomotion. It has a CPU, a number of microcontrollers spaced around the robot to control local activities. Um, it has a um, you know, six-inch display on the screen, and it has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular, cellular is coming quite soon. And one thing that's very important for any robot is to be able to sense the world around it. So, uh, for example, our robot really has cameras in the eyes, touch sensors, ultrasound sensors, infrared sensors. And uh, there's many, many things that go into a robot like this. So what I want to start with is just um, a, a collage of some pictures of robots, uh, or iPal robot in various different uh, circumstances. And you see it's running a maze at the top left. People gathered around it to take pictures. Um, we actually had uh, a Minnie and Mickey Mouse robot at a Disney event, and children actually uh, interacting with the robot, children in wheelchairs, and uh, both older and uh, middle-aged adults and also children interact with it uh, to a great deal. And the one thing we found is very important is that the robot has to look friendly and non-threatening, and we spent a lot of time on the design. And you know, I think we find that most people really enjoy it, they come up to it, they want to take pictures, gather around it, and uh, learn a little bit more about it. So I want to show just quickly just a short video of the robot actually working in a kindergarten in uh, China. Oh, 
去了又说了什么？闯过了我的两关。And so thank you. That's actually a school. So that's one of uh, the, the schools that we have in, in the China area. And uh, this will be coming to the US. Uh, we have a commercial version coming in July. And uh, we're actually selling a developer version. So if any of you have a great idea for an application for robots, you can take a robot, you can take the tools, create your own cool robot application, and then just sell it through your own channels, even brand it as your own. We really provide it also as a complete white label platform. And uh, so. What do we do with these robots? Um, and the one thing I want to mention is uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the pros and cons of robots. Um, uh, some people think that they'll take jobs. Some people think that if they get too smart, they're going to uh, take us. <laughs> but um, a robot like this is a little bit different, and the market is a little bit different. Um, a robot like this can provide services to many members of our community who maybe can't get the resources because they can't afford them or they're just not available. Uh, entertainment, safety monitoring, education, and a number of things. And I'm just briefly going to mention a, uh, a few here. Children's education, uh, as you mentioned, you see this example. We're also working with a uh, group in the Silicon Valley, uh, working on a STEAM version of the robot. Um, and uh, we're going to have that uh, prototyping in some charter schools in the near future. And uh, you know, one advantage is that in any classroom of a reasonable size, sometimes there are children who really need extra help. And this is a case where the uh, robot can fill in. In all these cases, we're not trying to replace teachers, families, or parents, but we're trying to provide additional services, assistive services, and so that's really the major focus of you know, our efforts and for robots like this. Elder care, um, so often that when I do conferences, people come up to me and say something, something similar to this. Um, you know, I have an older parent at home, I'd love to take care of them, but I have to work for a living. And very often they're home, they're lonely, uh, they don't always remember to take their medicine, uh, sometimes they don't know how to connect with the outside world. So this again is an excellent opportunity where we can very affordably provide extra services for those members of our community who may not be able to get them. And this is especially important because I think you've all heard about the, uh, heard about the aging population. And so, so how are we going to take care of all of these people in our community who've lived their whole lives, they've contributed, um, you know, over a lifetime? And so we need to find some way to, to serve those people, but also it has to be a way that uh, we can afford to do. And this is uh, an excellent way that robots like this can help. And again, family, similar sort of thing for education, entertainment, and uh, safety monitoring. Uh, in a family, it can entertain, it can help educate the children, it can get children interested in education and technology. There are programs on it where there are very simple programming languages where a young kid could even drag and drop different robot motions along a timeline and create fairly sophisticated robot motions. So it's a great way to get introduced to uh, technology and, uh, and programming. Um, Children with special needs, we have a partner we're working with who uh, is developing the robot for children with autism, autistic, so for autistic therapy. And the challenge there is that, at least in the US, most autistic children don't really get enough therapy because it's costly and there just aren't that many therapists. So the model here is, is very simple. Um, the robot, um, a therapist evaluates a child, sets up the appropriate programs on the robot. The robot can then go home with the child and give them as much therapy as they need. For autistic children, this is particularly appropriate because, as you know, a characteristic is that they tend to interact better with devices than people, and the goal is to get them to interact with people, the goal of the therapy. And so, what better way to start than with a humanoid-looking robot? And retail hospitality, um, there's a number of areas here. For example, we have one group that um, wants the robot to greet children as they come into a children's store, um, tell them about the products, um, entertain them, etc. Um, so, so this is one that I probably spent a little bit of time on. Um, it's extremely important. So what's important in a robot? It needs to, first of all, perform useful functions. And again, it needs to be non-threatening and uh, appealing and 
uh, appearance and behavior, and it needs to ensure safe interactions and privacy. That's certainly a key here. It needs to learn and adapt to its environment. It's impossible, really, to completely pre-program a robot to take uh, account of all the complexities of human interaction. So it has to learn in an environment. Um, converse at an advanced level, and conversational English systems and other systems are getting better all the time, and this is an area for future improvement and recognize and remember people's faces. In a family, for example, the robot should be able to recognize the members of the family and adapt their interactions accordingly to uh, who it's speaking to or who it's interacting with. Um, and it should show personality so it's not too robotic. Um, I won't go into great detail here, but the robot can sort of um, have different personalities. It can be assertive, it can be laid back, et cetera, et cetera. And so there are a number of things like that you can do to make, to make the robot fit in better um, with people and with uh, whatever environment it's in. Uh, detect and respond to emotion. This is actually quite an important one because when you talk to a person, it's not just words that are exchanged. You actually assess how they f you think, how, how you think they feel is that day, you know, what mood they're in, and just your interactions um, according to that. And eventually we'd like robots, at least to some degree, to be able to do that as well. And uh, just go on here. And I won't spend any time on this, but perception is important. The robot needs lots of different sensors and way to perceive the world around it, both so it can navigate an environment and also so that um, it can interact appropriately and safely with human beings. And for example, this one has cameras, microphones, infrared, ultrasound. The infrared and ultrasound are used for navigation also to avoid obstacles. So for example, the robot can run a maze and just like a human being would. It keeps going until it uh, sees something and then it turns around and goes the other direction. Um, Touch sensors, this is one we'll talk a little bit about, and uh, this is sort of a, a new area that um, is still being worked out. And uh, there are many other different types of sensors, LIDAR, uh, GPS, and a number of others. And the good news is that sensor technology is getting better all the time, and they're getting lots cheaper. So uh, we'll be having better and better uh, sensors as time goes on, which is a, a very positive thing. So what AI is really needed to make um, an effective social robot? Uh, the main thing is that, um, the robot needs to really be friendly and non-threatening and do something useful, and it should also interact in modalities that our humans are familiar with. That's vision, voice, um, and touch. And uh, I'll just go over these very quickly since uh, I don't have a huge amount of time. I just want to list some of the things, for example, on the speech side that a robot like this needs to do. Uh, obviously, high-quality speech recognition. Um, uh, in multiple languages, it should have a conversational ability so people can talk to it, you know, have it tell jokes, uh, start things. Uh, emotion detection, we've talked about that. And it should also generally be able to answer questions, you know, and queries. It should be able to, the person should be able to interact with it and get information that they want or need. Uh, again, different personas, we talked about that. Recognize people from their voices. And again, we've talked about that already a little bit. The robot should know its environment, who it's talking to, and adapt its uh, behavior accordingly. So, um, also, it should basically have pleasant voices. We don't want the robots to seem too robotic. That puts people off. And this robot, for example, we offer 12 really high-quality voices, so you can choose between man, woman, boy, or child. Uh, and that's one example of customization. And uh, again, the robot shouldn't be entirely passive. It should be able to initiate conversations uh, when necessary. And uh, you know, alerts when some news comes up. And all of that can be set according to uh, how the person who actually is using the robot, um, robot actually wants the robot to behave. And it can also be part of the learning behavior. And command and control, you like to be able to use your voice to move the robot around. Uh, if you get tired of it, you can say, go away, you know, and the robot will go away. And uh, so a number of things like that, you know, play games, start things, uh, the whole plethora of ways that you might want to control a robot by voice. Uh, vision uh, is very important. Again, face recognition is important. Um, emotion detection, and the best motion detection systems now uh, really are based on analyzing facial expression. So you have a camera that looks at your face, and it analyzes how your face moves and how all the features move. And they actually work quite well and actually can provide useful input to how the robot should behave. Uh, navigation and mapping of the environment, they kind of go together. The robot really needs to be able to navigate autonomously around an environment, and it needs to sort of know where it is in the environment, so that's the mapping part of it. Uh, 
There are many other things you can do, uh, play games. For example, this robot on it has, you can play rock, paper, scissors with the robot. You know, that's a simple, simple thing, it's a simple little game it can do. Telepresence, um, one thing that uh, a lot of the facilities, we're doing prototyping in some elder care facilities and uh, gated senior communities, and uh, the monitoring is very important to them. So uh, they really want a telepresence feature so that a caregiver, a parent, or whomever can actually remotely control the robot, you know, move it around, look through the robot's eyes, see how their child or elderly parent or whatever is doing, and then connect with them uh, through voice chat or whatever as needed or appropriate. And even in some cases, um, remotely to do a first stage doctor exam just to see how the patient is, feel is feeling and if they need some follow-up. Touch interactions I uh, won't spend much time on. Uh, the challenge here is that that's part of human commu communications. You sometimes touch people. And uh, this robot here, I'll just mention a couple of very simple things we do. If it's playing a song or something like that, and you touch its head, it shuts itself down. And uh, you can turn it back on by touching the head. And I've done many shows, and a lot of parents say they wish that they had that feature for their own child. <laughs> uh, but we haven't been able to offer that yet. And so it's a, like a timeout. Uh, and uh, so another thing we do is if you um, sort of uh, rub the sides. I mean, you can mention this, and also with touch, you could actually uh, sort of touch the robot in various ways to control it, to have it turn around, to do things like that. This is an area that's really not worked out at all. This is sort of a new sort of area that's kind of interesting, and no one really knows just how important or how significant this would be. So finally, what else is needed? So um, there's a lot. Uh, you know, as I think most of you know that robotics and AI is still at a very early stage in many respects, and it's apparent that a social robot needs all kinds of AI. And it's an interesting platform because you don't only need voice or vision or whatever, but everything has to work together in a package. So it's also an interesting research device, and a number of universities has actually published, uh, have actually purchased this robot, so it can actually take, take part in some uh, research as well as, um, as other things. Um, and, you know, deep learning is important, uh, learning from the environment is key. And uh, my own feeling is that in the future, um, what's going to be really important is we need improvement in most areas of AI, and I think there'll be some new areas that come up around the needs of robots that um, I think none of us have really anticipated yet. Um, I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about this, but this is kind of a cool photo of a conception of a robot from uh, the 19... Uh, 60s, I believe it was, and uh, you see they actually did a pretty good job. They actually uh, had a lot of details about how you actually with the hands, what goes in the head, things like that. Um, however, we're not quite there yet. We don't have things like we don't have the anti-gravity units. We haven't quite worked that out. Or the uh, superconducting um, uh, system memory. We don't have that as well either. However, uh, I'm not sure we need things like lock picks or uh, a diamond reamer. Uh, but anyway, um, so thank you very much. And uh, please, please come and see the robots around the area. We'd love to talk to you about them. Yeah, I asked Mark about the commercial availability of Cosmo, and I'd like to know about the commercial availability of iPal. Yeah, they're actually shipping in China and have been for uh, several months, and they're doing quite well. Um, we are selling actually developer versions right now, so anyone can actually buy a developer version and get the tools and create their own robotic product. And also, we'll actually have a consumer version shipping in July, an English language consumer version. At a price of? About, uh, in the US dollars, about $24.99. Not not twenty five hundred, twenty four ninety nine. Hundred, not thousand. Yeah, hundred. Yeah. Two four nine nine. Well, yeah. Um, the only other robot I know of in that sort of vicinity is Pepper. Yes. I've encountered Pepper, and I know that Pepper is a lot more expensive. Yeah. How do you compare in terms of specs? I think we're basically the same, essentially the same number of motors. In fact, we have, I think, some more capability. For We have a cool remote control device, which you can see if you visit the robots. We can remotely control the robot and have it do all kinds of things. And I, maybe Pepper has that, but I haven't seen it so far. So and uh, let what? me just, yeah, let me just mention, Pepper recently announced a commercial version of the U.S. for 25,000 U.S. Thousand. So yeah. we're talking almost a factor of 10. And our goal really was to make robots that ordinary families could afford, not just institutions and universities. Yeah, so if you wanted a little pet or toy around the house, 3,000 Canadian, Bob's your uncle. Thank yeah. you very much, and, uh, John. Yeah. 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 Yeah.